let's jump right in and begin talking about classes of organic compounds. When I hear the words organic chemistry, pretty much the first class I think of, the first prototypical set of organic compounds are the alkanes. The alkanes are hydrocarbons containing only carbon and hydrogen that are saturated. And here we mean essentially saturated in hydrogen atoms. They have the largest number of hydrogens possible given the number of carbons in the formula. And this is because they contain only carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen single bonds. So alkanes are characterized by carbon-carbon single bonds. Because those carbon-carbon single bonds mean that each carbon has four bonds total. Each carbon has the tetrahedral geometry and sp3 hybridization. And while you're not seeing that in these sort of simplified Lewis structures here, we do see in the three-dimensional structures the typical tetrahedral geometry at carbon in, for example, CH4, which is methane, C2H6, or CH3CH3, which is ethane, and C5H12, which is pentane. Each carbon has the tetrahedral geometry, and this is worth pausing and verifying to make sure that you can see it. We tend to name these compounds, by the way, based on the number of carbons in the longest contiguous chain. We're not going to talk about nomenclature in detail in this series of videos. You likely will in your future organic chemistry courses, but it's useful to know, for example, that methane is called methane because the meth prefix refers to a single carbon. Eth refers to two carbons, C2H6, and pent to five carbons, C5H12. And generally, once you get above four carbons, you're looking at the typical Greek prefixes here. Pent, hex, hept, oct, etc. Now, the structure of pentane in particular makes the point that organic compounds can contain a lot of atoms. There are a lot of C's and a lot of H's in this Lewis structure. But they tend to follow patterns, right? Carbon is satisfying the octet rule. Hydrogen forms one and only one bond. And these patterns recur over and over and over and over and over again in organic molecules. This is why we make use of condensed formulas and skeletal structures to compress the information in a full-blown Lewis structure of an organic molecule into a smaller and more manageable, more transferable, and still readily understood form. What a condensed formula does is it takes CH3, CH2, and CH groups and takes those explicit bonds and just packs them into a short textual form. So a CH3 group like this is simply written as CH3 with the implication based on the known bonding patterns of carbon and hydrogen that each hydrogen has one single bond to the carbon, and the carbon has four bonds total. We can also do this with CH and CH2 groups. Here, this CH has the three single bonds explicitly drawn, as well as a fourth single bond to this H that's written right next to it. And here's a CH2 with two CH single bonds at this carbon, along with the two explicitly drawn bonds. Now, what we're seeing through this analysis of the condensed formula is that carbon is always satisfying the octet rule. And very typically, carbon will satisfy the octet rule. So what we can do is simplify this structure even further by saying, OK, I'm going to take each carbon, which I know to be bound to four things, or have four bonds, more generally speaking. And I'm just going to write each carbon as the vertex or the end of a line. So where two lines come together and form an angle, there's a carbon located there, and on the end of each chain we have a carbon. And furthermore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate the hydrogens because I know it is implied that carbon is satisfying the octet rule in this structure. This means that each carbon has a total of four bonds. So for example, at intersection points where I don't see four bonds, I'm going to add hydrogens to ensure that that carbon satisfies the octet rule. So here, for example, I have a CH. Here, I've got two CH bonds, a CH2 group, to ensure that this carbon, this CH2 carbon, satisfies the octet rule. On the ends of the chain, I've got three CH bonds, or a CH3 or methyl group, so on and so forth. And this shorthand convention, which hides the hydrogens and hides the explicit letter C for carbon atoms, is known as a skeletal structure. And these are ubiquitous in organic chemistry. They are absolutely everywhere because this is a highly efficient way to depict relatively complex organic structures. And it's very easily 
uncompressed, right? Unzipped. It's very easily unzipped to expose more details where we need or want more details. For example, if we're thinking about a reaction that occurs at this carbon right here, maybe it's helpful to draw in that hydrogen, and we always can. We always have that option. And that leaves the rest of the molecule still in compressed form and allows us only to focus in on the part of the molecule that really matters to us. This is the beauty of skeletal structures. So you'll see all three of these representations, but as you move into more advanced coursework, the skeletal structure will start to become ubiquitous. And keep in mind here that generally you won't see these H's explicitly written out. You'll see the structure just looking like this and it will be expected and understood that there are H's there such that each carbon satisfies the octet rule. Let's practice drawing skeletal structures for the two molecules that you see right here. The first thing I would probably do with molecule A is just eliminate the carbon labels. So for example, we could take that carbon that I'm going to highlight in orange right here in the middle and see that it's connected to four other carbons. So we can put it at the center of four bonds like this. And we also know that we can omit the CH3s since it's understood that each of those carbons is going to have three hydrogens. We could also draw them out explicitly if we wanted to see what was there. A number of people will just go ahead and do this even in skeletal structures just to make it clear, hey, this is a methyl group on the end of this line. They, these can also just be omitted. And then at this carbon, well this carbon has a CH bond and two other bonds to carbon. So let's draw those two other bonds to carbon first. Now we have a carbon at the intersection of those three CC bonds right there, and the H can be omitted. So in fact, we're done. This is structure A. And keep in mind again that if we ever wanted or needed to expand this structure, we can just add hydrogens until we're satisfying the octet rule at all of our carbons of interest. So for example, that blue carbon we can see has one CH bond. Now it's got eight electrons total around it, and it's satisfying the octet rule. Compound B is a condensed formula, and here I think it's helpful to number the carbons to ensure we've got the right number of carbons in our structure. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in this structure. And notice it's a linear structure. There is no branching. Each of the carbons is linked to each of the other carbons. Don't let the H's appearing between the carbons fool you, right? We know that hydrogen forms one and only one bond. So the, the bonds, there must be CC bonds linking the carbons in this single discrete molecule. So what we can do is we can start with, for example, the CH3 on the far left. And I'm going to write that actually as H3C since we're going to build off the chain to the right. And we can draw a line to represent the first CC bond. We can then zag the line. This roughly indicates a 109.5 degree bond angle, right, typical for the tetrahedral geometry, although you'll see it drawn as 120 degrees in most sort of pretty looking skeletal structures. So now we've got uh, carbon 1 on the end here, and carbon 2 here, and carbon 3 here, and we can just keep going, zigging and zagging to continue to show that tetrahedral geometry until we hit seven carbons. So let's count it out, see what we've got. We've got four, five, six, and seven. And again, if we wanted to, we could write out CH3 on the other end to represent the other methyl carbon, although we can also just erase the CH3s. And here we are at structure B. And again, generally, as you move into more advanced coursework, you'll start seeing representations like these more and more often, and detailed Lewis structures like this less and less often, and developing that intuition for where hydrogens and carbons are located in skeletal structures is going to be really important in your future organic courses. Finally, I want to focus on the properties of the alkanes, specifically their melting and boiling points, state of matter, and their number of isomers and how isomerism comes into play with the alkanes. Now, the alkanes generally have very weak intermolecular forces between the molecules because we're dealing with nonpolar molecules here pretty much, right? Carbon-carbon, carbon-hydrogen bonds, very, very little polarization in these molecules. So they're generally very low boiling gases or liquids. And as we get to a larger molar mass, larger molecular surface area, stronger London forces, we tend to go from gases to liquids. So for example, methane 
ethane and propane are definitely gases at room temperature. Butane uh, wants to be a gas at room temperature, but is quite often put under pressure to liquefy it. Pentane, we're up in liquid territory, and we've got liquids uh, all the way up through tetradecane with 14 carbons. So most of the familiar hydrocarbons are either gases or liquids. Methane and ethane are familiar from natural gas, and gasoline includes hexane, heptane, and octane, for example. And we can see the melting and boiling points rising as we increase the molar mass of the compound. Now, the number of structural isomers balloons out of control as we get to a very large number of carbons, as you can see. Um, with octadecane, C18H38, we're already up to 60,000 different possible structural isomers. And the idea here is that once you get several carbons in there, there are many different ways to arrange the carbons to create different structures. So constitutional isomerism is extremely common. For a given hydrocarbon formula, there are often many, many different ways to arrange the atoms to achieve that same molecular formula. This slide sh shows you a pretty simple example involving n-butane, which is this linear structure on the left, and 2-methylpropane, which is a branch structure with a 3-carbon chain and a methyl branch, a CH3 branching off of carbon 2. These both have the same molecular formula, and that's very easy for us to check. We've got four carbons, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 hydrogens. So both of these compounds are C4H10. However, they have different molecular structures, and we can see that from their Lewis structures, and we can see the differences in molecular shape between these compounds if we look at the 3D models below. 2-methylpropane is a more compact molecule for example, than in butane, and that has an effect on London forces and other properties of these two compounds. So two very simple examples of structural isomers here, but structural isomerism is a ubiquitous concept in organic chemistry as a whole, really, but the alkanes is often where you see this idea introduced.